Okay, so I just came from the uh, Sid Mead uh, end to it um, convention uh, tonight at the Science World, and I'm um, just gonna give you a brief rundown. It was the uh, second time I've met Sid Mead in person, and very exhilarating. Uh, just to hear the guy's insight into the industry of um, f designing uh, sets and assets and props for films. Um, it was uh, very cool. It was a lot of work that I hadn't seen before. And he, you know, he was doing a few shameless plugs from his recent events, uh, products he's worked on, i.e. Elysium with Jodie Foster and uh, Matt Damon, which I'm going to probably go and see. Um, you know, so so it was good just to hear what he had to say. Um, you know, some of the artwork was was really really cool. I mean, we're talking artwork drawn in the sixties, seventies, and eighties, and uh, just his take on some of the artworks which didn't make it into his um, his uh, General Motors uh, car books um, because apparently. If uh, the artwork didn't have a car wheel in it, General Motors um, would actually reject it from the, the kind of coffee table art books that he was generating at the time. Basically, all his books had to have um, some kind of wheel in it. So it's a lot of work that you wouldn't have expected to see from Sid Mead, which was really, really nice. And then, yeah, there were some of his, um, his um, usual favourites, like... Um, the racing of the three drags, or, sorry, the six drags or six dogs, like a greyhound track with um, giant mechanical greyhounds. That was really good to see. Um, yeah, there was um, some sections on Blade Runner, which is really good because he went into a lot more detail than what he did before when I last met him, and you know, just talking about uh, what he did then, um, thinking about what was happening in two thousand and seven. I was, when I last saw him here in Vancouver, I was working for the games studio Electronic Arts. So my take on meeting him for the first time then was totally different to my take on meeting him now. Whereas now I'm no longer working for Electronic Arts, but I teach game art and I run my own micro studio. So, uh, you know, I have a different appreciation of what he does. And I look at it in a slightly different way to what, to how I did back then. So, so it was nice to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, just for some of the tidbits, um, one of the things with Sid Mead, if you ever get a chance to go to see someone like Sid Mead or um, Greg Mullins or uh, Ian McKay or any of the, or even like Daniel Simon, any of these major concept artists who are working on films, one thing they don't let you do is record um, the, the talk or the conference because that's how they make their living. Um, Sid Mead is over, I think he's 78 now, so he's still working commercially, but he makes a lot of his money through his books, his DVDs, and these talks that he does around the world. So obviously, you know, you don't want to take from the guy, that's how the guy's making his living. So I'm I'm totally appreciative of that. And so the $25 I paid to see him, bargain, bargain. I mean, you know, the, the, it was... Um, it was at Science World in Vancouver, and it was the IMAX theatre, and it was totally packed. Um, and it was really good to see. Um, but anyway, yeah, some of the things I can tell you that happened. Um, uh, one thing, um, if you're the photographer who's taken the official photographs for any of these events, please don't use a flash when the house lights are down and you're pointing your flash towards the audience because especially if you're in an IMAX where there's maybe a domed ceiling or a science world where they do the, the planetarium style kind of, um, sorry, my iPad just fell over, um, the planetarium kind of style um, domed ceilings, um, the flash actually reflects back into the eyes of the audience. So it was actually kind of funny because what you had is um, one of the ushers was running down the stairs like, please stop using the flash! And he's like, almost like the guy was swearing. It was so hilarious because it was like, it was almost like bolt of lightning. If you ever, and if you've ever been in a storm and a bolt of lightning has hit the ground and you stand very close, it's almost like white out. 
you come in like, oh, you can't see anything, your eyes are just, you know. So it's, if you imagine that this person is taking three or four shots, it's like, bam, bam, bam. And then it's reflected down. So it's kind of funny because Sid Mead's there with his cool dark glasses. And the audience is kind of like, who, who are we talking to? We can't see him. So, you know, hopefully, thankfully the, the photographer stopped doing that. That was kind of hilarious. But um, ju just uh, in general, just um, getting to the meat and potatoes of it, um, uh, the the interesting thing was he he was talking about working on Blade Runner, and the last time I, that that I saw him in two thousand seven, he was given the um, information on Blade Runner. He'd say um, obviously there was um, lots of reshoots, and there was a lot of stress on the set. Um, most of the actors and actresses were were at um, odds with uh, Ridley Scott. Um, the project ran over budget. Yeah, you know, I think it uh, for the time it was it was almost like six or seven times over budget. If you imagine back in nineteen eighty, I think when it was made eight seventy nine eighty, I think it was like ten million dollars. I don't you know. I could be wrong on the numbers, but I know that the money that they spent back then was regarded as blockbuster money now. Yet that money is now indie movie money now, so it you know goes to show how far we've come. So there was all that kind of stuff, and then there was I know when he in two thousand seven he was talking about how he was not the art director on Blade Runner, he was actually a consultant artist who's brought in for specific um, art visualizations for certain aspects of the film, certain shots, certain um, certain uh, uh, props. He was the guy who was brought in to, um, you know, to visualize, to give the, you know, a visual target for those um, individual parts. And obviously, if you imagine, if you're the art director and you're art director and you've got this other guy who's doing this other thing, it's kind of, it can cause some friction but he actually got a credit as visual futurist. So that was really cool to hear from him how these things were, 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 were going. And this is back in 2007. Fast forward to 2013 tonight when I met him and listened to his, his talk, Blade Runner, from this point of view, he came out with some new information. And then one thing I can't, I, either I watched it on the DVDs that I've got or I forgot, but he said Harrison Ford who played Deckard was actually at loggerheads more so than what he said in 2007. He actually said, you know, the guy basically hated the whole situation that he was in to the point where he, he was just like, let's get this thing done so I can get the hell out of here kind of thing. So, you know, we're talking, this is a guy who was there on set, you know, obviously this is close to 30 years ago. Things might have been embellished a bit, but the point is, the big, you know, if, if you know anything about human nature, you you know, we tend to remember negatives a whole lot stronger than we remember positives. So if there's something bad going on set, chances are you're going to remember that. And then, um, then yeah, he was showing um, some of the concept designs for uh, the final set where he was doing like matte painting on glass for where um, Roy Batty saves Deckard. Yeah, and he's holding him up by one hand and um, he showed the matte painting of that where you know that was done he showed um, the uh, the scene where um, I forgot their name um, uh, I think it's Joanna Casti played the the, the the woman with the snake and she you know she's running away and Deckard shoots her and she runs through six or seven panes of glass and he showed the concept after that, which was really cool because I never saw that before. And then, um, you know, then obviously there's the classic spinner that he designed. And he showed some of the concept art for that. So it, it was really cool to get a different take from the same guy with a five-year difference on what is now regarded as a classic, one of the most classic films of the 20, of the 20th century. So that was good. And then he went on to talk about um, the artwork that he's done. Um, you know, lots of there was actually quite a few bits of concept art from his um, his latest book, which is Century Two, which I've got here. And oh, and by the way, if you ever get a chance to meet uh, a concept artist that you're really 
um, fond of his artwork or her artwork or you see their work in a film, if you get a chance to meet them, go meet them, go talk to them because, you know, I'm unfortunately, um, Mobius died last year, Ralph McClory died last year, and I really would have loved to have seen those two guys' works, you know, they worked on classics like Indiana Jones, Star Wars, you know, there's lots of things they worked on that I love. But anyway, so I showed you this before. This is um, the Century uh, 2 art book. And what I'm going to do is um, just try to see if I can find the... Uh, yeah, here we go. So he actually was talking about um, this visual, which is the... If you can see there, it's basically, there's a really good story to that. So if you can see that on there. It was, um, what would you do if you're a billionaire playboy? And this is called the Playboy Millionaire Issue. And it's like Playboy for the future. So you've got your, you've got your yacht, you've got your car, you've got your apartment. How about a spaceship? So it's like showing you a million, million, um, millennium pad for the Playboy. And then, you know, there was lots of other things like... Um, vehicles which were used gravitational forces to fly um yeah yeah it showed us some concept art from the film the core which if you see there you go some concept art there it's kind of hard to see but that was a really good uh, you know so here we go so so yeah there's some good stuff there um yeah, it was it was really good to you know hear his take on this, and this is a thing as well because you know a lot of this a lot of the artwork in this book you know I've read and you know but it's always good to hear it from the guy who actually designed it, and he was working on the artwork for the Jetsons film which never got made but it's good to see the good to see his take on the concept art that that we have in this book, so it was really nice to see really cool to hear his take on current films and things that he's been working on. Um, and then it got to the, um, the Q and A. Now this is where it got really interesting because in the Q and A, it's you job public asking this guy, what's your take on this? What would you do in this situation? How did you deal with that? And um, one of the things was a lot of people um, were asking him, um, you know, what was it like to, um, uh, design, you know, cars back in the 60s and 70s. And this is the thing, this guy probably did, you know, a couple of years in cars designing what we would regard, you know, if someone says, I want to be a car designer, you assume they design everything in the car. And this guy's telling you, well, guess what? I did maybe 10 years of that. And the most, I, you know, the, the only thing that I can say that I contributed that you would visually recognize in a car it's a tail light. So, you know, he's done all this work and all the, the only thing he can say that you, he could say, look at that car, that tail light is mine. That's it. Whereas you'd assume he designed the whole car, but because obviously he can design the whole car, hence he can go on and design whole cars for his, um, for the films he's worked on, i.e. Blade Runner, um, and design vehicles, i.e. Um, the Sulaco in Aliens, um, the drilling machine in the core, uh, you know, and, and, and some of the some of the vehicle, space vehicles in 2010, as well as the vehicles in Tron. So he has the skills to do that, but in the actual real real world environment, the practical things that he's designed is is big, but you only see a small part of it. And he actually explained that the reason being is car industry is a billion dollar industry. They have to give the customer what they want because you never know what the customer's gonna like. And, you know, all the focus testing, all the designs, all the Q and A, you know, you, you know, if the customer doesn't like something, you know, it ain't gonna sell. So obviously car companies are gonna be very conservative because they wanna make money. They're in business to make money. So if they make a car, part that doesn't look appealing to the public, guess what, they're going to have to change it. So hence, changes are very, very minimal to maintain the customer base. So that was good to hear from him. And then he went on to say how, just, how he's designed um, yachts and, and interiors of jets and um, hotels and things like that. Excuse me. And then 
you know, so so you know, there's a few, lots lots of questions about design and how he, you know his take on certain things. And one of the big things he was pushing was how would the future look? So he's saying, okay, how would the world look in 50 years? And he actually said, you know, he actually answered this question by saying the most that we can actually look at is only. 15 years into the future before we start losing touch with reality because he said things as the, the the world is moving so fast that um, it's really hard for us to to, to actually um, visualize the changes and that the reason being is because we're actually we're living in those changes right now for instance um, social media when was Facebook created? I think it was 2004, 2003, 2004. You know, it's not that long ago. Um, so in the space of eight years, we've had Facebook come online and come to be the dominant social media network. Um, there's others that have come and gone, like MySpace has come and gone or come and dwindled. We've had um, Friends Reunited. If you live in the UK, you'd recognize that one as a big one. We have, obviously, Twitter is still here. Um, LinkedIn is the, kind of the business side of one. So, you know, and there's, there's others there. But the point is, he's saying that's a social change that technology has brought on that nobody even saw coming. Obviously, there's the other ones, like the, the rampant growth of the mobile phone to become a super tablet, it's technically a tricorder. Um, he's saying, obviously, computers are getting so fast. And, you know, so there's lots of insight there. And then one other question where someone was asking where he thought it was going. And he said if he had to guess where he would put his money would be in nanotechnology. And it's like, yeah, because there's lots of things at that level which we've not even seen before. And that could, again, be another revolutionary stage that we might jump to. So, so that so it was good to get his take on where he thought the world would be going, you know, dependent on on um, on, on current technology, and, and then you know so so that was one question, and then um, so some of the other questions that were asked was um, uh, on on a film set, um, did he ever have any situations where? you know, he was asked to do something and people might not have agreed with him. And he said, well, that happens all the time. You know, you, you know you're know, you there to create a vision for the director. So, you know, it's your job to make sure that the director's, and the, the, make sure the director's vision and the, and the script come to life. You know, that's your blueprint to work with. So that's a good thing to hear from him. And then, then it moved on to, um, I mean, some of, the, some of these questions are obviously from professionals, some are from students, so it's really hard to kind of just remember what's going on. But one question which, which myself being a, an instructor and a mentor, as well as an industry person uh, and an artist, uh, you know, and, you know, the one question that came up that I've been asked myself I've thought of myself and I've actually had to react to myself came up and he answered it like a pro the question that came up was um, would you, how would you regard um, a designer or would you as a designer um, fake it until you could make it and get the experience to become good and professional um, how would you advise someone to do that and would that be a good way to go forward you know in current tech and current society and I don't know if the guy was a pro or a student or you know don't know who he was but my colleagues sitting to my left and my friends sitting to my right we all just kind of went oh because for us that's the question that the students ask us when they don't want to do the work, when people ask me for advice, that's kind of the hip hop kind of mantra, fake it till you make it, kind of, you know, wide boy kind of, you know, you ducking and diving methodology of getting ahead. Now for some circumstances, that might be totally valid. You might be able to get away with it until you can stand up and say, yeah, now I can do that. But he answered that in the most professional way 
and he backed it up. And what he said was, what you're talking about is hubris. You're talking about someone putting their pride before um, the respect that is needed to create the art asset, create the concept design, create the, create the concept art, or create the product to which you've been hired to do or the job you've been hired to do. He's saying, I have never done that. I would never recommend anybody to do that. And I would never be putting myself or someone else in a position to do that. And it, he went on to say, um, it, he didn't actually say it, but you could tell he was saying it in certain words, it's unprofessional. You don't want to do that. And he said, whenever he goes to an, a film a film that someone's hired him to do, or a concept art for a product, or a vehicle, or a set, or anything, or even if it's for fun, Whenever he works on a new project or projects he's been hired for, he comes at it with a totally new, clean slate perspective. Um, he even, and this is one thing I always say to my students, before you come to a, an instructor and ask for help, Google it. Now, as Sid Mead said, when he started back in the 50s and 60s, they didn't have Google. They didn't have Google. So he says... Google is a wonderful thing. I can get all my research off Google. I don't have to fake it. I can go out, do the work, do the research, put down a template, work from that template, and then present a product to the client. You know, and it was just such, I mean, I probably didn't do the answer, do, do his answer justice, but it was such an eloquent answer that I, I'm, I think he nearly would have got a standing ovation for that answer because it was just, it, it was um, it was an answer that was needed for our current generation where, you know, everybody's living with a 30 second soundbite and just to hear this guy tell you to your face, faking it to you, making it is BS. It's BS. You're not doing yourself any services. You, you, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. And he was saying, I do not do it. I do not recommend it. You should, you should be um, working hard to deliver quality work. And I was like, awesome. Everybody around me, they were like, yeah. You could tell the whole audience just agreed with the guy. I almost felt sorry for the guy who was asking that question because, you know, an industry pro schooled you. Got you. He got schooled by that guy. And it's like, Awesome. It was just awesome. So anyway, so the, the, you know that's the meat and potatoes of it. Um, it was it was a great night. Great to see Sid Mead. Um, I got to to get a, a couple of photos with him. Um, got him to sign my uh, Century Two, which was awesome, and my Century One, which was really really good because that one he signed and they say got Sid Mead's signature there. And then. It, um, you know, he's asking me what I did, and I said that I teach uh, game art as well as run my own micro studio. And then I got him to sign my very rare Future Concepts book, um, which I got um, in an auction off eBay. And he's actually saying, yeah, he rarely sees these books turn up. They are very, very rare. And he gave me the awesome signature of putting his signature, you can see that, put his signature right next to his printed signature, which I thought was cool. And, you, you know, the, the, the guy is awesome. I mean, like I said, I've been lucky enough now to um, meet this guy twice. I know people like um, Feng Zhu, um, Scott Robertson, Daniel Simon, all these other famous concept artists, artists have actually worked with this guy. He calls them friend. They've gone around to his place and he's given them private copies of books with, you know, with inscriptions in there. I mean, I can only hope that I can work hard enough, get my skills up there, because we're always learning, we're always moving forward, and you never know. You've got to keep on going for it. But yeah, like I say, uh, so this is um, uh, Roger Mitchell. Uh, just giving you a little quick um, Tiger Shark Studios update, um, just to let you know where you know what it's like to meet one of your game artists, film design, concept artist legends. It's a real honor and a pleasure. So 
Until next time, see ya.